So there's one more thing we need to look at about the scientific method, and that is data analysis. And these are some pointers on how to turn results into conclusions. So the question we often start with, what is it we are talking about? Well, data analysis is what we do after the experiment is finished and we have our results or our data. And what we need to do now is answer our question or prove or disprove our hypothesis. And this means analyzing the data carefully. So there are many, many different methods of data analysis, and we will look at some of the most common ones and some of the simplest ones. Data analysis is often, not always, but very often about numbers and the mathematics of analyzing numbers and large groups of numbers, especially, is called statistics. So, we also need to quickly mention the difference between two different types of data, and that's quantitative data and qualitative data and say those words quickly. So there are two very different types of data, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data is based in numbers, quantities literally, and analyzing it is about looking for patterns and usually needs some maths, some statistics to get it right. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is about features or attributes, the qualities of something. So if you're looking at, say, animals, and you want to see different types of animal, how they survive in different places, the qualities they have, like their body size, their fur, are not numbers, they are things you must write down. So we will talk mainly about analyzing quantitative data because it's the most common one that we use in science. But there are always different examples of qualitative analysis and there are even ways to combine the two. So frequency is one of the earliest statistical terms from maths and it's literally just another way of saying how often or how frequent something is, how many times you see it. So really it's just another way of talking about quantity. So looking at the table below, this is a class of 33 students and we asked them about their favorite ice cream and this is the number of students who chose each different flavor and we call it the frequency. So strawberry has a frequency of nine. The frequency of people who like vanilla ice cream is seven. You can talk about frequency in a number of different ways, but remember this is not the same as electromagnetic frequency. This is statistical frequency. And although the meanings are connected, they are very much not the same. Averages, or the mean, is its statistical term. And I think many of you have already done averages in mathematics. An average is one of the most basic statistical techniques. It takes a group of numbers and it tells you what value would they be if they were all the same. If you had the same total, the same total quantity, but all the numbers were the same number. So to calculate the average or the mean of a set of numbers, you add them all up to find the total, and then you divide the total by the number of objects in the set. An average turns a large group of numbers into one number, but you need to know why you're doing it. You need to know exactly why you're averaging numbers. <clears throat> Maximum and minimum. Maximum and minimum values are what we call the largest and smallest values in a set of numbers. The maximum and minimum values are often useful numbers to look at. So look at the maximum and minimum in all these different types of data. There's money in someone's bank account. 
is your maximum five thousand dollars the minimum is just five hundred dollars what's the maximum here yes it's 81 and what about the minimum the minimum number is 12 Okay, another kind of statistical analysis is correlation. And we normally look for correlation on certain types of graph. And what we mean by correlation is we mean a pattern that shows that one variable depends on another. And remember, when we talked about variables, we said it was very important to make sure that our independent variable is what changes the dependent variable. We want the dependent to depend on the independent. So there are two types of correlation, positive and negative. And correlation can also be weak or strong. We will look at what that means in the next couple of slides. Correlation is easy to see when you plot your results visually on a chart or graph. And the examples will show exactly what the different types mean. So, these graphs both show positive correlation. So what do you think positive correlation is? It means that as x increases, y also increases. When x variable goes up, y variable goes up. It's easy to see that line that the data follows. So there's the line that the data follows and the graph on the left shows a weak correlation because although that line is very clear, it's not actually very close to the line. All of the data is above and below as well as on the line. On the right hand side, this graph shows very strong correlation because the data is very close to that line. So you know that Y goes up very very close to x going up whereas on the left y goes up kind of as x goes up but it can also vary maybe with something else so here is negative correlation and as you can see it's just a negative gradient on our line but again it's easy to see the line in the data as x increases y decreases X variable goes up, Y variable goes down. And there's that line in our data again, and it's exactly the same when the data is scattered around the line. It is weak correlation, but when the data stays very, very close to the line, then that is strong correlation. And then finally, this is a graph which shows no correlation. There's no pattern in the change to X and Y. There's a little bit of a group in the middle. Maybe there's something about that, but it's not a correlation between X and Y variables. So now we need to think about aberrant data. And aberrant data is just unusual or strange data. It could be just a freak problem, or maybe it shows a problem with your process, with your experiment. So, here, here is a graph of strongly correlated data, but there is one piece of data which is very, very obviously outside the line of an otherwise very, very strong correlation. So this is a piece of aberrant data. This data shows no correlation, but you've still got something that is very clearly a little bit aberrant. It's much higher than the other data on your chart. Why is this? So you should always try to find a reason for aberrant data. Sometimes it's okay to ignore aberrant data. Uh, seems like your correlation is otherwise very strong and you have repeated your results many times, then one or two pieces of aberrant data should be reported but you should say why you are going to ignore them and say that you think you have got enough repeated data to show your correlation 
So after you've finished, you should also look for problems. So aberrant data, as I said, should be explained. Why does it happen? Is there a reason for it? Look at your process. Is there anything you could have done to make it better? Any way you could have controlled your variables better? Sometimes you have to let control variables vary a little bit. If you're using sunshine, sometimes it's cloudy, but you still need to take data. So look at your process and try to find ways to make it a better process. And also explain holes in the data. If there's missing results, if you forgot to take a measurement or if you spoiled a test by changing a control variable, then you need to say why. The more holes there are, the less reliable the data is. But sometimes data cannot be perfect. You should always try to make data perfect, but you will not always succeed. Also think about the limits of your recording. So why can't you record twice as much data, for example? Why can't you do twice as many experiments? Or even, why can't you measure to more than two decimal places? You need to explain why you have not given more accurate data than you have. So let's just look at some of the basic types of graph and chart that we use. These are ways to show data in a visual form and we are very visual and it's easy to use our eyes to interpret data more quickly. Graphs and charts are easier to read than lots of numbers or written data so it's important to choose the right type of graph or chart though. Bar charts, for example, are a very simple way to show simple numeric data. So you can have a horizontal or a vertical bar chart, and each block of data or bar of data shows a frequency for different categories. So on the left, there are different soap operas from England and how many million people watch them. And on the right, there are different products and how many let's say millions of items are sold of different products. So each of those bars is frequency. There are more complex types of bar chart. So here we have essentially three different data sets of bar chart in one chart space. So it's like three bar charts in one, but it makes it easier to compare three different teams over four different years. Scatter graphs are the things we looked at when we looked at correlation. They are just simple data points plotting two things against each other, two variables, your independent variable, which is usually the x-axis, and your dependent variable, which is usually the y-axis. So here's two different types of scatter graph. You can see the second one includes different types of subject. It represents men and women. So there is, again, ways to combine different charts on one graph. So do you see any correlation here? Well, seems like there is a little bit of correlation in the chart on the left, but there's also a very strange set of results which might show that the correlation is not real. Here's another plot and there are some very clear correlation in where the red, green and blue dots appear but none of the correlation is very strong. The red is probably the strongest correlation on this chart. Here's another kind of scatter graph which shows very strong correlation but different correlation in different parts of the chart. So correlation is not always as simple as a line. This is why we call it non-linear correlation. Pie charts are something you may well have seen. They show all the data in a single circle and that means the whole circle is 100% of your data. So pie charts can come in many different forms, but they are all basically about showing proportion of data. 
Who has the biggest piece of data compared to all the others? It's a little bit like a bar chart, but it's easier to see proportion on a pie chart. But pie charts are not always the best thing to use. For example, here's a pie chart of the American states by population. And it's not really very useful for looking at data. All we can really say is that Florida, New York, Texas and California are the big four. Then there's another group of second biggest and then most of the others are kind of the same. They don't look very different. So it's not easy to see the proportions. This is quite pretty to look at but it's not really that useful for analyzing data. Histograms. Now these are very similar to bar charts but there are several important differences and they are mostly about statistics. The bars in a histogram are touching each other and this is because the groups are continuous. So 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. So it's not like bar charts where we just have product A, B, C or soap opera A, soap opera B. No, these groups are collections of numbers. So maybe this is exam score in percent. You don't just get 10, 20, 30, 40. You can get 17, 39, 52. So this is continuous data. So we try and put it on a histogram. And one reason we do this is because the data shows us something about probability and probability distribution of the data. This is not something we're going to look at, but it's a very important part of more complex data analysis. So line graphs now. These are another var one variable versus another variable, but it means that very often the variable is changing continuously like time. So this is the change in money in someone's bank account over time. And this area doesn't show a probability, but it can be useful in other ways, which we again won't talk about. But analyzing line graphs is another important area of statistics. So finally, I just want to talk about turning qualitative data into quantitative data. It's just a little trick you can sometimes use to look for patterns in qualitative data. So you can't usually analyze qualitative data by statistical techniques. It's not easy to do, but you can observe qualitative data by looking at the qualities you observe and making conclusions from understanding those. But sometimes you can say count how often you observe a quality. You can take the frequency of a quality and in this way you can make some quantitative data so this is the wonderful world of numbers and you might not think it's very wonderful I'm sorry if you feel that way but the kind of relations that statistics can create is really really huge statistics can analyze data in a massive different range of ways and can analyze large amounts of data you remember when we talked about our caveman and scientific method we said that for the caveman everything was easy because there is not much to look at today we have large amounts of data to look at and the only way to find new conclusions is to find very very large numbers of repeated results and to analyze those results sometimes we need very very powerful computers and we need statistics so this is just an introduction to the idea of data analysis but it's really the way that we control information and controlling information is the key part of the scientific method that allows us to use what we see to make the world better